Hiya! It's us again! Welcome to episode 92, part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for February 2020. I realised during last month's introduction, I mentioned that it was leap year, but I didn't really explain why we have to chuck an extra day at the end of February every four years. It seems a bit weird to be honest when you think about it, inventing an extra day. Is it for tax purposes? <laughs> Maybe it's become some sort of loophole in law by now. But its roots are truly astrophysical. We need an extra day every four years to make sure that our modern Gregorian calendar stays aligned with the orbit of Earth around the Sun. So the Earth doesn't actually take exactly 365 days to orbit the Sun. It's almost 365.25 days. Uh, but it takes the Earth precisely 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes and 45 seconds to go around the Sun exactly once. So, if we don't make up the extra hours and minutes every 4 years, our calendar will get messed up. And humans are real sticklers for repetition and routine and repetition. <laughs> don't believe me? How uncomfortable were you at the start of this episode when I switched out the usual greeting for a very gen one? Yeah. <laughs> it knocked me off kilter as well, I've got to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was my point exactly. So, I mean, really speaking, it wouldn't actually matter if we didn't have the 29th of February every four years. Nothing practical would change, but it keeps everything in order just how we like it. So we do it. I'm Jen, and if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm your host for this episode. <laughs> Joining me on our extra long journey around the sun this month is my favourite Martian, Paul. Oh, your favourite. Oh. And my favourite Martian, Ralph. Oh, your favourite. Hang on. It's like kids, isn't it? You can't what? have a favourite. Oh. Huh? You just tell them, you tell both of them that you're the favourite and then just let them argue and watch the chaos unfold. No, Paul, I'm you? the favourite. No, but do you know what I tell my kids? I tell them. Whichever one it gets ready last is the one I will leave behind come the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have kids. Mm. Judges won't allow it. <laughs> <laughs> now then, now then, now then. Oh no, we've had we've had complaints <laughs> about that, Paul. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which we didn't want to amplify on Twitter. Do you know my cat tried to follow me to work the other day? I like physically had to pick her up and put her inside the house and lock the door. Because she just kept popping up. And wow. following me it was really weird it made me very uncomfortable like the start of that episode made everyone else very uncomfortable <laughs> so we're all in a bad place really awkward silence yeah exactly it's it's fitting with the theme of the show anyway <laughs> what's occurring can i give a shout out to some films and tv shows that are doing the rounds at the moment Ooh, that go I've on, quite then. enjoyed oh yeah that's nice so because, as you know, I was going over to New York recently when I got to go to the Cradle of Aviation Museum, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I On the <laughs> flight, I was watching a film that I missed at the cinema that I was kicking myself about called Ad Astra, which is um, a film with uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Brad Pitt. Yeah, I missed this as well. It's not that good. Oh, is it not? No, I've not heard good things about it. Gotta say, I mean, they've spent a lot of money on it and uh, it's a good cast, but... It's just a bit too much of a kind of Solaris Event Horizon mashup, and it's it's just a format that's a bit tired. And when you get to space pirates on the moon, you'll just tune out at that point. <laughs> I mean, it's it's worth watching, but you're not you're not going to come away from it thinking that was a good film. You know, we, you know we've had things like mm. Gravity recently, and we've had a couple. Well, we've had a few space films recently that have been particularly good and getting new people interested in space and space mm. exploration but I've got to say yeah. Ad Astra is not one of them. On the other hand another film that I missed at the cinema but I got to see on the plane was Lucy in the Sky which is a bit lower budget, wasn't advertised as much not distributed as much but it's Natalie Portman I've and John Hamm. I've not heard of this one It's very good Yeah. I've got to say it's really good So this is, um, it's got a bit of a... There's a bit of a trope around astronauts not being able to capture, not being able to get the same kind of kicks when they're back on Earth. And what this does is just it, it adds something a bit more original to that idea. So it's a it's a really good tale of an unraveling obsession in the pursuit mm -hmm. of perfection. And 
it's more of a psychological thriller which sounds a bit dull but it's really not and a really nice twist at the end when perspectives change you know kind of like the angle of the storyteller and i just think that that was one of the best space films i've seen and it really didn't get much publicity Mm. on the other hand something that's getting tons of publicity is star trek picard which um um this is amazon prime's new offering new series it did Mm. um i think was it star trek discovery the one recently which i tuned out after halfway through the first series because i just didn't like it didn't get invested in the characters but picard really good because you already know the characters you know they bring data back Mm. and and it's um jean-luc picard that everybody loves from the especially if they're growing up the same era as me in the next generation um and it's just really nice it's got that similar kind of vibe to lucy in the sky where it's you know it's the idea of somebody that's uh in this case it's somebody that's I think he says it himself that it's not so much he's retiring, but he's just waiting to die, and he's just desperate to to relive the memories and become disillusioned. Uh, mm. But it's a really nice psychological take on Picard. It's a bit more of a deeper, thinky kind of uh, mm. offering, and I just hope that I've, I'm as the point we're recording this. I've, there's only been one episode that's been released. Um, which is really good. So I'm just hoping it's not going to be in the same vein as War of the Worlds, which we all talked about on here after watching the first episode, and then it just went gradually downhill and became dreadful by the final episode. See, see, hashtag see Dracula as well. Yeah, that did the same, didn't it? Really the good first same. episode, and turned just got worse and worse. Oh, the first episode, Dracula. Ah, that was one of the best bits of horror, gothic horror I've yeah. seen on TV ever. Yeah. By episode three, it was like awful. Watching it was like watching Buffy. Yeah, <laughs> and we're seeing the same now with the viewing figures on Doctor Who as well. Where yeah. um, just saw a news article mm. today saying that um, mm-hmm. now that I think they're dropping something like a million viewers a week, and it's the uh, lowest viewing figure since 1986. Which given which when they, that was oh. Sylvester McCoy in 1986, that's low viewing figures. That's when they cancelled it yeah. the, the first time. Was it? Yeah, are we getting through to get into a cancellation after what ten years or so? Probably longer I than that. I would have thought so. Mm. I've been waiting for that with Doctor Who. Yeah, oh, I thought it was going to keep going really? and going, but yeah. I, I was. It was going to run out of steam eventually. Mm. I think it is. I done. mean, this is true. And it'll, it'll have a, then another sort of ten, twenty, fifteen year break, whatever it was, and then they'll bring it back again. Yeah, and hopefully this we'll all be around just, for that. Just what happens. It's regarding Ad Astra. Sorry, uh, there, there was a, a tweet um, saying if you weren't to Kenny Astra, Andrew Hunt at Mr. Underscore Andrew Hunt on Twitter, did no one realise that Brad Pitt just played a rocket scientist who had a car? Those are three things that didn't impress Shania Twain much. <laughs> and Shania Twain's we Shania Twain. Come on, John. Shania Twain has retweeted it. Oh, no. has she? Really? Yeah. Ah, oh, yes. Nice, nice. And you know what? I actually listened to the song. I saw that tweet and I was like, oh, sh- I'm going to have a listen to it now. <laughs> I bet you loads of other people have done it. And so she suddenly got a bunch of extra revenue. Yeah, because she needs it. <laughs> oh, Ben. That was playing in the Stonewall Inn when I was there last week. Oh, I was very, I was very envious of that. America, mm. That's history, that is. Uh, I have, John, yes. Um, you, you, we had an evening in the Stonewall Inn on Christopher Street, which was very nice, going back to the, the roots of um, of Pride. And, they, uh, and you know a very that was chilled run, yeah. out atmosphere it was too. It was run by the Mafia, that was. Was it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was the whole thing. It was um, the story of, of uh, Stonewall is that the um, it was a bar, because it, cause of course it was essentially illegal to, to have this sort of bar. Uh, it was run by the mafia, and so what the mafia did was they set up a gay bar, but then used it to blackmail the people who went to it. So you had all these people from like places like Wall Street and things like that who would go to it as a as a sort yeah. of safe haven, but actually they were then blackmailed by the mafia who were running the place. Um, and then so the the police then decided to raid this place, um, and that's when it all kicked off. And they they, oh. they decided to raid it. Um, they usually warned that the raid was going to happen, but they didn't. 
um, and they only turned up the couple of cops and they said, oh, we're taking over the place and da, da, da. And actually, that that's when the stand happened. And actually, yeah, it's, it's, oh my it's a God. really fascinating um, I had no idea. I had story. no idea either. So, the, so all the people that were and seeing this as a safe havens were pawns in this cops and robbers kind of thing yeah and then it's so and but then but then that's that's when the kind of line got drawn and then that's when the stonewall riots yeah kicked off uh and that's that's when pride began wow yeah oh you learned something here folks <laughs> yeah it's not astronomy but you've learned something yeah there we go i love that Should we do some emails? Yeah. So we have been asking and asking and asking for reviews. And we've got some. Yay. And actually, we've had quite a few of them recently. So thank you, people who have been giving us reviews. Um, I'm not going to read the reviews out in their entirety, but just the titles, um, apart from one of them, um, because it was a bit of a mixed review. And, you know, I feel like you've got to take the, the good with the bad, haven't you? So, uh. Looking at iTunes, we've got Ricky Mel, who said, always eagerly anticipated. Nice. Missed UK, truly awesome. Nice. Nice play on words. Uh, Pico4321, my go-to astronomy podcast. Aww. Cairo Mike, always entertaining. Like, this is brilliant stuff. Mm. Uh, all five-star reviews as well. Um, so Gastronomicon, was the, this is the mixed review, so they say... Like the show, though not having a telescope, I sometimes skip the actual what to see in the night sky stuff. Fair play. Uh, can't say I want to hear politics on the show, even though I agree with most of it. I am eager to hear the astronomy news, launch news, etc. And I miss the explainers they used to do about what stuff is and how it works. Stars, planets, radio telescopes, etc. Or am I thinking of someone else? That said, the relaxed style is engaging, the hosts likeable, and the discussions on news items the most interesting bit. But that's just me. So I'm hoping that the introduction of the electromagnetic spectrum bit is going to satisfy the woes for lack of explainers. That's that's that that's going to appeal, surely. That's what yeah, he's been waiting. Yeah, and for. we've actually cut down on the politics. I've noticed because there's so much going on at the minute. Uh, we haven't got time. Uh, and do you know what? We just don't have time. Ah, uh, I can't change it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, carrying on, we've got. Andy H underscore 94, who is actually Andy in my office and he's recently <laughs> started listening. So, uh, hi, Andy. Let's see if he is continuing to listen to this podcast and see if he says anything to me. Uh, he says, fantastic. Kay Quinn says, best Astro podcast out there. Smiley face. No, uh, Dollar no, sign no. 287 says, a really interesting and informative Astro podcast interspersed with moments of hilarity. I like this smiley face uh which is what i actually asked someone's comment uh so thank you for doing that whoever you are um if you remember a few episodes ago i actually asked people to comment like that and yay people listened um em in silk said i love jenny woo i love you too and uh grim jack 65 says i like this thumbs up smiley face i like this no nice. yeah I like this too. Like, it's great. So thank you everyone for your reviews because um, it does help us reach more people and kind of spread the, the good word of awesome astronomy a little bit further. So thank you all. And, and massages our egos. It does because, I mean, let's face it, we do this for free. So people telling us that they like yeah. it is the only thing we really get. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's the only pleasure I get in, in every four weeks. So the rest of the time... <laughs> It's it's misery and pain. It's like a desert. It is like a desert out there. <laughs> so anyway, we'll we'll do an email as we usually do. So yeah. Paul, give us the email. Email. This is from our good friend Blake Furman of Virginia in the US. Last episode, you said to send a message about what we'd like to like, so the show can be the show we want. I want the show that you want. Ah. That's nice. It's nice. I've listened for about seven years or so and love what you guys do. It's clear this is a good part of your life and not something you do for work. Keep up the awesome work. You're all great, mostly Jenny, but her greatness rubs off on the... Hang on a minute. Rubs off on the Martians. (laughs) (laughs) I'm liking this less. Uh, P.S. When the invasion starts, please select me as a pet. I promise I won't mess on the carpet. 
Blake from Northern Virginia. You don't want to see what we do to pets. <laughs> you don't want to see what we do to pets. That, yeah, that's, you, that's... You've got no idea what state John is in. No, no, no. He, he's he, prolapse. He's beyond Ruined. that. Anyway, right. Ruined. Let's. I suppose we better move on, haven't we? Yeah, let's do the space news. And uh, in a wonderful sense of continuity, just like the last episode, Paul is going to kick us off with something explosive. So off you go. Boom! Ah! But of course, in space, no one can hear you cock up. Um, <laughs> for my first story, we have a satellite in danger of exploding in geostationary orbit in the form of DirecTV's oh, Spaceway One. Uh, which is a 15-year-old six-ton TV satellite built by Boeing. <laughs> and in fairness to them, and let's face it, they need it. Um, it was designed to last only 12 years, so it's gone beyond its lifespan anyway. Um, it suffered an unexplained anomaly back in December, which appears to have caused significant irreversible damage to the craft's batteries. And there oh. now appears to be a real possibility that if they are recharged, they will then explode. How have I not heard about oh, this? Oh, dear. Well, because you're not paying attention, dearie. Okay. Um, they cannot be isolated, and now the race is on to deorbit the craft out of geosynchronous arc, where, of course, all the Earth's biggest, mm. most important, of course, most expensive satellites are. So, not uh, so it's like they don't want to, at the very least, pollute the arc with a dead satellite and debris, mm. and, and the worst, of course, damage the others because it's quite a crowded arc. Yeah. Um, this race has a deadline. Uh, as we're about to hit a period of the year where the arc gets eclipsed from the 25th of February, because of course the position of the sun and things like that, we get towards equinox, things like that, uh, meaning mm. that the battery power will be used, because of course part, as, as the geosynchronous orbit spins in 24 hours, it will then spend a period of time at night time, um, and of course the battery will then be used, and then of course it will then recharge. Um, uh, and that's, that's that, danger. Yeah. And it does that automatically um, then. Exactly. Um, right. So it's being moved by venting small amounts of the rain propeller. And what they're doing is actually raising its orbit. Um, right. As is often described with the satellites, the, 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 it can't have a Viking sort of funeral. They can't be burnt up. That That's too far yeah. to go. It's too, it's too expensive. So they, there's a there's sort of satellite graveyard above geosynchronous orbit where they, they move these satellites oh. out to. So they move them up in um, the orbit rather than deal. They move them about 300 miles kind of further oh. out, and that's kind of where they leave them. Um but here is the other fly in the ointment because, of course, um, the company has admitted it can't vent all the fuel in time um, before oh, no. we hit the deadline. So not only um, is is this thing potentially just going to explode, it's going to explode with about 73 kilos of um, propellant Oof. in it, which is quite a lot ah. for a satellite. Um, <laughs> so look out for exploding TV satellites at the end of the month. Yay! <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> um, Starlink seems to be... Uh, yeah, you're a good, it's not you know, too bad. Um, Flutter up the sky with bright, bright lights from unnatural satellites seems the order of the day. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that that was fun. Um, I think that's a fun story. Uh, we may hear we may hear of it exploding before this episode even goes out. But <laughs> yeah. um, it's it's um, yeah, bit of a doozy that one. Um, and interestingly, Boeing's been trying to sell that chassis. Uh, that that satellite's based on as an interplanetary exploration satellite. Uh, yeah. Not sure they're going to make many sales now. Anyway, uh, no. Um, so anyway, um, a spa a, a space plane, a <laughs> space plane. There we go. Put my teeth back in. A space plane that you may never have heard of has been cancelled. I have heard of this one. Yeah, well, I'm not. I'm not surprised you've heard of it, frankly. But um, <laughs> this was DARPA's. XS1 program to create a reusable and responsive launch system that would give the US military faster, cheaper, and more regular access to space. Well, the collapse of the program seems to be initiated by, you've guessed it, Boeing. They are <laughs> really not having a good time. But conversely, no. they're one of the three bidders for the next lunar lander. No, nah, no risk. They're not there. getting that job. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, um, they announced they were pulling out of XS1 um, and not developing their what they call the Phantom Express, which is kind of an appropriate name when you think about <laughs> it. Now. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're not going to develop it any further. Uh, so this was a winged sort of rocket powered by a single shuttle engine. Um, and it would carry a second disposal stage on top to orbit, then return to land autonomously on a runway. Um, and they were supposed to d be doing 15 demo flights this year because the, the kind of whole point of XS1 is that potentially it could fly almost every day 
It was it was what? one of these sort of it could well what they want is a, a and DARPA was looking for sort of very very quick responsive. We need a satellite in space to to take a photo of X or listen to X or do something fire like almost like a missile. Um, and right. it would pop pop this thing into space, come back down, be reloaded, and off it goes again. So they you know a bunch of them, and they could kind of basically like a, like the space shuttle on steroids. Well, it's, it's a, a way... way of being able to get a payload up into space for whatever mm. that mission dictates. So you might need it for rebroadcasting. You might need it for yeah. Um, um, as a relay satellite, you might need it for imaging. You might need it for well, there's a whole range of covert applications you yeah. can use it for. Yeah, this, this is military, so you're looking at this sort of, you know, a, a situation develops, as a, you know, a crisis develops, whatever. You you can put space a payload force. in... Space Force! Exactly. Space force. You can, but you'd be able to put a payload in space really rapidly. You, you'd, you'd have mm. a bunch of, you know, on-call... Sort of, and we're only talking small satellites, we're not talking big things, um, that you could put up to cover a, an eventuality. Mm. Um, and, and this was... See, it's deemed as, and it probably is cheaper and more responsive than building, you know, a really massive satellite that takes years to plan and goes up, but is then there and can't be changed and all the rest of it. So they were going to do fifteen demo flights this year to kind of prove the the concept of the system, but it appears, despite what's probably a decent check coming Boeing's way, the program's failed, and it's not just another black mark against Boeing because this is another failure by DARPA who have struggled over the last decade to bring this sort of future plans for space access to fruition. They've, they've had various kind of programs that have never really paid off. Um, it's a shame because on pure aesthetics and cool factor, Phantom Express was a cracking vehicle. Yeah, nice to um, look at. If you've seen pictures of it, it's brilliant. 90 metre long winged Mach 10 suborbital shuttle. Um, it looked like it was straight out of a sci-fi book. And frankly, that's where it's going to remain. <laughs> I'm dumb. Nice one. Ralph, tell us something stellar. Great segue, Jen. Thanks. I actually did a good one for once. <laughs> so first up for me is the imminent launch of the European Space Agency's next mission to understand more about our nearest star, the Sun. Uh, ESA have four classes of missions that they run for their spacecraft. Small class of those costing 50 million euros or less. That's 55 million US dollars. And the Cheops exoplanet hunting satellite, which was featured in last month's show, is one of ESA's small class missions. Medium class are those costing 500 million euros or less, that's 550 US dollars. And this solar orbiter is one of ESA's medium class missions, along with their Euclid dark matter and dark energy uh, study spacecraft, which is planned for 2022. Large class are those costing 900 million euros or less, that's about a billion US dollars, and the JUICE mission to Jupiter's icy moons and the LISA space-based gravitational wave detector are large class missions. And finally there's the FAST class, which funds missions of what they call special opportunity, uh, the Comet Interceptor mission to study a long period comet or an interstellar object that Paul explained a few months ago falls under this category. Oh, uh, so like sending something to something like Borisov. Yeah, if they, if they wanted to do that. It's, it's a mm. bit actually similar to what Paul was explaining with the XS1, that it's kind of like when you need to do something as a uh, a dynamic, let's get it done because we've only got this quick opportunity to do it. It's that kind of thing for a fast-class mission. Yeah. And the Solar Orbiter medium-class mission will launch on an Atlas V next month to spend seven years studying the sun. Um, wow. In fact, even when it reaches the sun, it'll take three and a half years to get into its operational orbit. So it's going to get Ooh. quite toasty even before it gets to work. But how close the, is it getting then? How much? What? Sorry, it's going to two point eight four naught point two eight four AU. Wait, that's like Mercury, right? So it'll be so about it... half the orbital distance that Mercury is from the sun. No, was this? Not point two eight, right? About three quarters. Three About quarters. three quarters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well so inside it's... the orbit of Mercury, and the objectives of the mission are to perform close-up, high-resolution studies of the Sun and the inner heliosphere to help us better understand those things that are still outstanding mysteries about the Sun, but st still affect us very heavily on Earth. So things like how and where do the solar wind, plasma, and magnetic field originate in the corona? 
how do solar flares and coronal mass ejections affect the structure and dynamics of the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere and upper atmosphere? How do solar eruptions produce energetic particle radiation that fills the heliosphere? And how does the solar dynamo work and drive connections between the sun and the heliosphere? And that's scheduled to launch on the 5th of February. Cool. And shout out to Stevenage, my hometown, that built it. Oh, did they? Oh, really? They did. Yeah, it's built Stevenage, sunny, sunny Stevenage. Yeah. yeah. So nice. next up, dividing opinion. Um, I know even within the realms of this podcast, um, NASA are going to be voting on the name for the Mars 2020 rover. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so this has clearly got Paul rattling in anger and Twitter groaning with a typical cynicism, particularly this side of the pond. Uh, where NASA have released a short list of names for their Mars 2020 rover and asking the public to vote for their winner. Now, there should be absolutely nothing contentious in that and a very laudable thing it is too. So the Mars 2020 mission is scheduled for an Atlas V launch during a 20-day launch window, which will open on the 17th of July this year. And it's due to land in Mars's Jezero crater on the 18th of February next year, where it'll begin collecting data on the Martian environment and gathering rock samples for return to Earth by a future mission. So, back to the more prosaic. More than 28,000 names were submitted to NASA, and we can only imagine Damn. what awful, and probably a few really cool names, were submitted amongst those. But NASA have down-selected the list to nine dreadfully earnest and fate-tempting duffers, all submitted by children 12 years old and younger. So if you have the stomach, you can go to mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 slash participate slash name hyphen the hyphen rover and register your vote before the closing date of the 27th of January for any one of this shower of shite. <laughs> Clarity, courage, oh. endurance, Ooh. fortitude, Ooh. ingenuity, ah. perseverance, Ooh. promise, tenacity, vision, or Marzi McMars face. No, that last one's one you made up, isn't I, it? I made that one up, yeah. I, 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 you know what? It's, it's the British cynicism. <laughs> yeah. But those names... Clarity. Who the hell? The clarity. That was probably a four-year-old. Do we Paul. want to take a bet oh. on what one we think is going to win? Perseverance. Ooh. This sounds like a self-help video. <laughs> Do we want to take it? Come on, let's take a bet. I have any of you. You know guys what you looked? need? You need clarity, courage, endurance, fortitude, ingenuity, and perseverance. And I promise you, tenacity and vision for your future. <laughs> See, it, it's just nonsense it is nonsense i think it's going to be let's take some bets courage and endurance i think endurance they now might you go gotta for. pick one endurance i'm going for endurance i voted for clarity because it was so crap i want it to be called clarity now yeah especially if the camera doesn't work oh exactly exactly all these things clarity the, the, the instruments won't work it won't, won't fight Cur- uh, courage is the only one that you could probably get away with I don't know. I feel like endurance. You said In- endurance, didn't you, Ralph? Yeah, but endurance, if it doesn't go the distance, then yeah. you've, you've invited... Fort- and courage is already blown anyway because they pre-tested it out on the Mars 20, uh, yeah. uh, Curiosity rover, so yeah. they've de-risked it anyway. There's no courage there. They thought, Promise. oh, this is a really good chassis. We'll use this again. Whoa, yeah. that skyframe worked really well. We'll use that again. Where's the courage? <laughs> yeah. Promise. I... Promise. I they know, they I can't call it Promise. That's probably I the best one might. because there's a chance it might find ancient life. Oh, yeah, exactly. Promise. I'm going to go Promise. Oh, no, that's an awful name for it. I'm promise. going Promise. Who calls it Promise? M- NASA. I'm, betting, I'm not saying that's what it should be called. I'm saying I think that's what's going to win. Oh, each of these names just, just like, boil my piss, frankly. Mm. They're so tepid. Well, that's all right because we got the Rosalind Franklin, haven't we? And it's going to do better. So. Ah, but the Rosalind that- you see... Cool Rosalind name. Franklin will splat into Mars and absolute obliteration on the surface faster than the Mars 2020 will. <laughs> what well, do you know? Mars 2020 is bigger. <laughs> yeah, but it's got a sky crane that works. Or will it? Da, da, da. Yes, it will. <laughs> yeah, probably will. Yeah, NASA, NASA don't screw up. No, it's true. ESA and Roscosmos do. Anyway, let's move on. 
Sorry. Yes, yeah, so fi- finally for me, uh, next month NASA are putting out their budget figures for the Artemis programs cost <gasps> through to 2024. So exciting. Yeah, now that that sounds pretty dull, but this is the date of the first moon landing that mm. they're proposing under the Artemis program. And the funding proposal is scheduled to be submitted to Congress on the 10th of February, so we should know more about the Lunar Gateway lunar orbiter and the lunar lander's expected costs and timeline so there should be a lot more information there mm. on what they're going to look like and as i mentioned before that boeing is one of the prime contractors that they are uh, that have a bid in to be the lunar lander um blue origin being the other one that's already been announced and i forget the name of the third one because it's not a name that i'd heard before but there, there's three in for that so exciting mm. it is it is it is very so there'll be more about that in the march show yeah shall we do the big space news why not what what is it it has to be of course the spacex crew dragon testing yes that happens it only oh, really worked <laughs> i know it went flawlessly yep. basically mm. whenever do you went... see a rocket exploding and that being a success on purpose <laughs> yes they were like Yes, it blew up exactly when we wanted it to in exactly the way we wanted it to. <laughs> um, anyway, bit of background. What, what are we talking about? Um, SpaceX performed a uh, test of their Crew Dragon capsule. And the test was to prove that the launch escape system can carry astronauts to safety in the event of an emergency on the rocket. So this is not when they're in space, but you know when they're, they're in the air, they're traveling up, something goes wrong, can they get away? Um the whole point was to make sure that the spacecraft can get free of the rocket and get to a safe distance. And this was a major test that needed to be passed um, for Crew Dragon before SpaceX can start flying astronauts for NASA under a commercial crew program. Uh, they used a proven rocket. So this was actually the fourth flight for this rocket. That they what, used. the same one? This is the fourth flight of that rocket? That booster, yeah. yeah. And Whoa. the last one. They've, they've now exploded, mm. but... It was the fourth flight, so they're also showing that, yes, we can reuse our rockets over and mm. over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the plan is to prepare for a crewed launch in uh, April 2020. Oh. Um, I know, right? Bob Benken and Douglas Hurley, the astronauts, making their third trip into space, but the first on a commercial spacecraft, a 14-day mission to the ISS, but it may get extended. Anyway, we're getting off track. The plan was, 84 seconds after liftoff, when the Falcon 9 is at Mach 2.3, uh, the capsule was going to fire its um, eight Super Draco engines for 10 seconds, which would then rip the capsule free of the second stage of the rocket. Then two and a half minutes after liftoff, um, it's going to jettison its trunk service module to clear the heat shield ready for entry and prepare the craft for a splashdown. At the three minute mark, the capsule was going to reorientate itself so it's ready to land. Five and a half minutes, deploy its initial chutes to slow it down, um, and then deploy its bigger chute shortly after that, which was a major test um, for the, for the four-chute parachute design that they've got going on because the parachutes have been successful in drop tests, but this was the first time mm. that they've been used in like well, an actual flight. They're an actual redesign. Yeah, and they've actually had yeah. parachute issues um over the last little while so this yeah. was a big, and then big after thing yeah 10 minutes or so splash down about 20 miles offshore um and that was the plan and that is what happened it went remarkably well yep mm. i tell you do you know what i i found in that sort of um different different sort of interest level of, of what went on is they all also recovered the trunk the service module Oh, did they actually? Oh, did they? They did. They did. They cr- and they recovered it pretty much intact. Oh man! Amazing. So they might show- refurbish that and reuse that. I don't know if they, it, it's it's refurbishable, but it was not destroyed. Yeah. Um, they, so this thing you know, crashed into sea with nothing stopping it. It, it wasn't uh, there was no parachute or anything on it or, or flotation, and they recovered the trunk, the service module. So and and you, you see pictures of it, and it looks remarkably intact, which mm. is which is a real testament to how well this thing is built. Yeah. This was one of those tests that 
worked so well on TV as well because, you know, with limited human attention span, this the whole thing lasted for, I think, nine minutes and 20 seconds. Mm. It, it yeah. landed uh, in the ocean, actually, about 40 seconds shorter than it was intended to. Yeah, but, but, you know, you could watch the whole thing go and everything was happening like every minute or two. Mm. So it was just really exciting to watch. Yeah, something going on. But, yeah, it, um, it's really important to do these sorts of tests because, as we saw in October of 2018... Um, when uh, Nick Hague and Alexei Ovchinin, uh, they were on their way to the ISS and they had an in-flight anomaly on the Soyuz and it was the Soyuz abort system that literally saved their lives. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. You yeah. know, they are rare, these in-flight anomalies. They don't usually happen, but you have to have something in place because it's not worth mm. the loss of life. It's not worth risking and it. And, of course, that's the whole thing about the shuttle. It didn't have an abort system and John Young referred to yeah. it as a I mean he was the guy that tested it out and was the head of the astronaut corps after you know being the Apollo mm. astronaut and he said it was a death trap because it didn't have an abort system yeah. and of course and we saw on well I mean the the second one coming through the atmosphere clearly wouldn't have been saved by an abort system but certainly the the first shuttle that blew up on its ascent would have yeah. been saved if there was an abort system mm-hmm. well it, it's it's I mean the the Soyuz has had two Abort. Yeah, in all its decades of service, which is a pretty good record, actually. Which, yeah. which, which you know, the two two times on launch where the booster has failed, one was on the launch pad, and it actually took it away from from the launch pad. It hadn't even left the ground, and one was was the one um, in two thousand eighteen, and it worked perfectly both times, saved two crews. Whereas you think of the you know the certainly the Challenger. You know, it, it, an abort system probably would have saved that crew. Yeah. Because the, the flight data shows that they were alive until the point of impact. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some sort of recovery system would have saved that crew, yeah. which is which is the real tragedy of, of that, that disaster. Because rockets go wrong, they do. Of course they will. They're machines and, built by humans, and humans are not perfect. Yeah, and, and there's, a whole, there's a whole background to that failure. But nonetheless, rockets do fail. They would have been saved if there had been a board system. So it is important. People talk about, oh, you know, we don't need a board system, but no, it's a really dangerous thing to do. So it's a yeah. very important system. And yeah, this went really, really well. And yeah. the good news is that the abort system is always the last thing to get checked out and yeah. tested mm. on a mission, which means that now we are in that position where the first crewed Dragon Two mm. flight is likely to be just three months away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because Elon Musk no, two is saying. Months away as we're releasing this, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because Elon Musk reckons that the capsule and the rocket are going to be ready by the end of February, but it's going to be longer because they need to, you know, plan the flight path and and make sure that they know exactly the timings of everything and and you know launch windows and and all that jazz. And NASA want a little bit more um, analysis, of course. They do. Um, and they want a couple more tests of the parachutes as well um, because they, there have been issues with the parachutes and the parachutes are, uh, they, I mean, it goes without saying, they're so critical Yes. and you need to know that they're going to work. Yeah. So they, they, they want a couple more tests of the parachutes. But in a way, that's no biggie. That's, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways they test those um, and that should be completed pretty quickly. So, yeah, very exciting. The US... They mm. haven't had orbital human spaceflight capability since 2011, and it's all about to change. Yeah. So, it's time for the shiny new part of the show, the electromagnetic spectrum. So if the mole people haven't stolen your shinies. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get over that, can you? <laughs> if the mole people haven't stolen your shinies. <laughs> well, if they are oh, going to steal our shinies, it's going to be in this show because in the last show, we covered what we actually meant by the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so in this show, the second part, it's always more about the people and the instruments. So that's what we're going to cover in the second show when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. But this time, we're going to kind of take a quick fire journey through the electromagnetic spectrum and talk about people who are really instrumental in discovering different parts of it. And we will probably come back to some of these people in more detail in later episodes. So let us begin. Um, 
I found this when I was researching this. Um, I thought it was pretty incredible that it wasn't until the 1800s that we discovered light beyond the visible part of the spectrum. And when we did, it was purely by accident. So it's the year 1800 and Sir William Herschel was experimenting with visible light. He was using a prism to split sunlight into a rainbow of different colours and he was testing the temperature of the different colours of light. Um, he happened to put a thermometer just past the red end of the spectrum and to his surprise he found that this thermometer measured the highest temperature. So he had discovered something invisible heating up his thermometer and this was infrared light. And Herschel's discovery inspired German physicist Johann Wilhelm Ritter to wonder if there was anything beyond the violet end of the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the following year, he found that there was some sort of invisible light that was darkening silver chloride paper quicker than the violet end of the visible light. And this light is what we now call ultraviolet light. And then over the next sort of 60 years, a lot of scientists spent a lot of their time investigating electricity and magnetism. It was kind of the hot topic of the of the century, really. Um, and, you know, it was people, names that you've definitely heard of. You've got Faraday, Ampere, Volta, Ohm, um, and then some other people who are not so famous, like Orsted. But in 1864, James Clark Maxwell um, summarised much of this work that had been going on in his now famous Maxwell's equations, which describe things like the lack of existence of magnetic monopoles, and they also quantify the speed of light. Now, what's really interesting about Maxwell's equations is that there isn't anything in them to limit the wavelength or frequency of light. And this had an interesting implication because it looked like there were lots more different types of light to find. And in the late 1880s, Heinrich Hertz, um, who actually sadly died at the age of 37, very young, mm. um, but he generated the first radio waves in the lab. And then about eight or so years later, Marconi developed the first practical radio receivers and transmitters, and you know, their use for communication was unleashed upon the world, basically. The next big step in the history of the electromagnetic spectrum was 1895 where we take a giant leap from radio waves all the way up to the other end where we find x-rays and Wilhelm Rotgen was working with a cathode ray tube which is you know what they used to use in the big box tellies um, and his tube was similar to those that are used in modern fluorescent light bulbs he filled the tube with gas and then he passed a high voltage through it making the tube glow and then he covered the tube in really thick black paper and he found that he could still see the light hitting the screen a few feet away. And he discovered a form of invisible light that was so powerful it could pass through solid objects. And as an aside, he actually realised that the light would pass through human flesh but then leave a ghostly image of the bones hidden beneath. And he actually took the first ever x-ray image using his wife's hand. I've got an add-on and- to that. Oh, go on. I won a Mars bar for being the first person at school to answer the quiz question, who discovered x-rays? So I will never forget Wilhelm Röntgen because I got a Mars bar for it. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if chocolate can't make you learn, then nothing's going to, is it? So, finally, the last bit of the puzzle is gamma rays. And they were discovered about five years after the discovery of x-rays in 1900, but not through experiments with electricity, but through the study of radioactive materials. And Paul Villars was studying radium and discovered that the material was emitting extremely powerful invisible radiation. But it took another 10 years of study to confirm that this radiation was another form of light. And they did this using a combination of diffraction and reflection experiments with crystals. And there you have it. In the course of one century, just one century, the world went from knowing only about visible light through to a whole electromagnetic spectrum of it. And there are more sub-regions that we haven't discussed today, um, particularly when it comes to astrophysics, but we are going to explore those in the coming episodes. And yeah, we're going to start our journey through the electromagnetic spectrum at the radio end next month. I also want to say, the 19th century, the 1800s, was such a phenomenal yeah. time of discovery. I mm. mean, uh, everything... Of course it was. They knew p- all. 
It was really easy. But also, the work they did in electricity, they, um, the discovery of entropy, yeah. the thermodynamic uh, laws of thermodynamics were refined in that century. What a... I mean, I think even more than even though we discovered things like um, Einstein's relativity and uh, the quantum world in this, sorry, not this century, last century, I think yeah. the century before was just so much more impressive in what they learnt about the world we live in than it, even the 20th I century was. I think this century is going to be really impressive. To a degree. Because but we've had things I, like gravitational waves. I'm almost in... in starting to feel a little bit foolishly like Lord Kelvin uh, when he was saying, <laughs> you know, there's nothing else left to learn other than more and more precise measurements. Because, you know, he was realised that uh, after, after he'd said that, you know, we discovered the whole world of the quantum realm and relativity. Hmm. But I'm starting to get that kind of almost confidence to think, no, we're not, how much more are we going to learn of this universe? You know, we've, we've got everything cracked now. We can yeah. refine things. You say that, that's mm. actually quite interesting because in that interview I did um, with the guy about the Hubble constant, yeah. um, there's actually some very interesting things in there about how Lambda CDM is um, not not really working. So you think there's something... Mm. And Lambda CDM is basically our theory that explains the universe, right? That That's like our, our current theory. So there's this train of, of thinking that as as Newton's theories of gravity are to Einstein's theories of gravity, is that the modern lambda CDM might be like that to some other more complete theory of the universe. I, and of course, we haven't I was, reconciled quantum mechanics with classical mm, the classical world. I was going to say that, so. that, that there was a couple of things I was going to say, that, that actually there's been a lot of chatter recently that... Um, and we, we didn't bring it up in the, the, the astronomy show because it, it's still kind of coming out at the moment. And, and I thought it was more next month that the whole dark energy thing yeah. might not be exactly how people have been thinking about it for the last Yeah, I was while. wondering if we were going to cover mm, that in this show. But even yeah, so, we this haven't. is still an area, of, an, an area of physics that we yeah. are already probing it's not like it was in the 19th century where oh, we they, didn't know what electricity that, was we didn't yeah. understand that, what entropy was well entropy wasn't even a thing we didn't know anything about ultraviolet yeah. or gamma rays or that that's what i was going to say mm. that, that the other thing was that, that actually all of this clearly the 19th century is all the all the outpouring of the industrial revolution yeah. So it, it's up until that point, the none of the, the, that science doesn't really kind of come about because it didn't matter in some respects because none of the things that it it comes out of or it affects or we we need to understand it in order to to make a thing it happened. It didn't didn't exist. You know there there were no steam engines, so you didn't need to understand uh, you know, yeah. thermodynamics. Yeah, um, thermodynamics and and all that basically comes out of the invention of the steam engine the need for power yeah and and the need for power and the need to understand how yeah. steam engines work to make them more efficient and how these systems work mm. and how we can make factories and all. that all the comes out we've of... got is that we've had a hundred years of experimental theoretical physicists yeah which um, have kind of envisaged anything we can think of mm. barring an absolute step change in our understanding of physics, yeah. like some groundbreaking thing that's beyond dark energy, dark matter, or, I mean, what else are we considering now that is, like, f almost fringe science? I, well, I don't know. In, in, but in a way, what happens is the, the, the 19th century is is that sort of... I mean, in, in that to perhaps help him out a bit, old, old Kelvin, he was kind of right in some respects in that, you know, they discovered all science as such. N not really, but what they discovered is all the bedrocks of science. Yeah, and then and so. then what the what the twentieth century was was expanding the knowledge, yeah, and our understanding of the data based on all those bedrocks that had been established essentially through the nineteenth century, um, ending with Einstein essentially and yep. and the, the the quantum scientists and things that so, you know that and and ever since then it's about getting better data and more accurate and understand because if you think about you know what what's the the last hundred years been it's basically about proving Einstein right or wrong, yeah. And that, um, that's Kelvin. It's about better measurements yeah. to be able to refine what we know. Mm. And there, there are new things, and, and that's been the say the, the interesting. We didn't cover it in, in in this month, and I think we'll, we'll pick it up next month. Is yeah. this whole 
question that's arisen because I'm still reading about it and still trying to sort of get my head around what they're saying is this idea that dark energy might not exist. Yeah, and that's going back and forth at the moment. And isn't that's it? a yes, exactly. And there's there's a lot of debate going on suddenly, mm. and I'm yeah. trying to get my head around the whole thing myself. The this this what's been a bit of a keystone of, of cosmology for the last good certainly last 10 years probably several 20 years. De- well a good couple of decades yeah but but one that's been really accepted in the last sort of 10 to 20 years is this idea of dark energy you know because that's what um w map um seemed to sort of suggest it, it, it kind of you know that the, the universe was was getting bigger faster and so it became accepted that okay there's this thing called dark and energy. nobel it, prizes were awarded for yeah. the discovery of it and <laughs> and then suddenly we've got various groups not just one saying actually that might be a mistake yeah and this is not dark matter dark matter is another thing with whole lots of you know bags of evidence and all the rest of it we don't know what it is but there's, there's that's a whole different thing there's this thing dark energy which has kind of been accepted because there is a some mathematics and, and some some observation that suggests that there must be a basically a big pushy force hmm. and now it, it there's all sorts of things are coming out that, that suggest maybe that is entirely wrong um, of course, the big thing well, that appeals that, that that strikes itself to me is why is it called dark energy when it could have just been simply called the big pushy force? It should have been just called the big pushy force. Um, yeah, let's leave but, it there then. But we'll leave that there because that's that's next month. That's, that's next, next month. month. That's next, that's next and we month. need to finish this month. And so, it's time for the question. And host always gets to decide, and I'm hosting. So, I'm going for another funny question. Um, <laughs> and it's one that's definitely crossed all our minds. Um, and this is from our good friend Brocken James. And I know Brocken from work. <laughs> so, I wonder if he's actually going to listen to this. Uh, but he did actually send this in via tweet. This is not him just sort of bumping into me and going, Oh, BT Dubs, here's a question for you. Anyway... Back to the question. It's a fantastic oh, it's question, fab, by the way. It's brilliant. It is, it's brilliant. Have the crew of the ISS, or any other space flight with room to try it, propelled themselves through their craft using flatulence? <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, is The something... great thing about this is we know the answer. Yes, we, we do. have an actual answer. <laughs> and this is something that everyone has definitely thought about. And you can almost guarantee that some kid has asked you at some point, it's like, can you move by yep. using your farts in space? So, yep, um, I've been asked. Gonna, yeah, but I'm going to start off with some um, interesting facts sort of about farting when you're in space. Um, first up, when you do a fart, it doesn't move. Just stays put. So what? imagine you're sort of floating through the space station. You're on your merry way to go and take a few pictures and you just sail through someone else's guff. Just like a little cloud of green. Just it stays just hangs there. there. Yep, yeah, didn't move. Oh, man. Just stays there. There's no fans and stuff blowing the air around. So it's it, it just sits there until someone moves through it and then drags it oh, with them. no. No, yeah. crop spraying, yeah. crop spraying. <laughs> now, the good thing is, is that the spacesuits are equipped with filters to deal with it. Um, but I guess your dilemma is, if I let it rip now, only I get punished. Or I could hold on to it, wait until I get back inside and then get revenge on someone for stealing the last rice pudding. <laughs> which is almost definitely what I would do if I was up there um, now, the ISS does have filters on it obviously because otherwise they'd run out with oxygen very very quickly and you know the build up of carbon dioxide would be atrocious but the other side of it is that they need to filter the farts away because um, farts are flammable <laughs> and having something flammable <laughs> in an enclosed space is uh, it's not a very good idea is it <laughs> <laughs> and tonight on the news at 10 ISS destroyed by <laughs> farts um, another interesting thing is that it turns out you fart a hell of a lot more in space um, because the gases in your stomach get all mixed up with like the food and the liquid in there uh, because of the zero gravity so you can't burp 
It's the only way to get gas out of your system is for it to come out the back end. Oh, mm-hmm. really? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you cannot burp in space. Um, yep. But anyway, we're going to go back to the original question. And fortunately, the diamond dazzler that is Chris Hadfield did uh, an Ask Me Anything on Reddit. And someone actually asked him this question back in 2013. Um, and it turns out that the answer is no. Too muffled, not the right type of propulsive nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> Only an astronaut would answer a question like that. As a thing you are. Engineer, but test pilot. how many of you out there now thinking... Yeah, but could you attach a nozzle? I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> I never even thought of that, but I now I that. am. I thought that. That was the first thing You're, that went through my head. Which I exactly. You. You're now thinking, what kind of cone could you attach? Yeah. Like, would it work? Yeah. It's a, it's a sign. It's the kind of thing Rocketdyne should design, frankly. Um, <laughs> not, not just a solid rocket engine, but mm. also a fart propulsive kit. Um, I, I going- was thinking about this and i reckon you know when you're icing cakes and you have like the little nozzles on the end of the bags <laughs> i reckon one of those what, the, would do they're it. different shapes basically you yeah. want to shove one of those up your chafter and see if you'll <laughs> blast yourself across the iss <laughs> in a star-shaped fart or a circular shaped fart yeah, jen, exactly. jen smoke rings why have you got a piping bag shoved up your ass? <laughs> <laughs> the little crescent moon one would work beautifully though oh i like that <laughs> and it wouldn't be who, who ate the last roast pudding. It would be uh, who ate the uh, the last shrimp cocktail because apparently that's the uh, that's the dairy girl thing on the uh, the ISS. Hmm? So mm-hmm. let's put this out to the listeners. Listener, what what shaped aperture would you like for your farts <laughs> on the International Space Station? And a shout out if oh. if you've got kids and you like they like farting and they like space. There is a British a British kids film called Thunderpants about a kid who can fart himself into space. <laughs> and it stars it stars Stephen Fry, so what more could you want? Oh me. Thank God you took it that way. I was like, so if you've got children and they're interested in space, give them an icing bag and say uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shove your kids' arse on an icing bag and blast them into space. <laughs> Off you go, little Johnny Toot away merrily. <laughs> <laughs> oh god so tell me Mr Hill why are you no longer a leader of the scouts <laughs> <laughs> well we tried to get the space badge and the cooking badge in the same same night <laughs> and so now the end is here. Enjoy the extra long wait until the next episode. Only, it's not really an extra long wait, because February is still the shortest month, <laughs> even with an extra day. And the dark skies of the Welsh Brecon Beacons are a-calling. From the 25th to the 28th of April, we'll be hosting another Astro Camp Star Party for people of all abilities to come together and explore the planets, nebulae, star clusters and galaxies in a relaxed and friendly environment. It's a great way to quickly master observing or imaging and you even get to hang out with Jen. Oh, yeah. Head over to astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com to book your place for just £45. <gasps> Barking. And it turns out when it comes to humans, failure isn't just an option. It appears to be a way of life. Thousands of you listen to this. Yeah. How many retweets? How many face twat posts? Failure's the lot of you. The poorest advert for the capacity of humans to achieve is the listenership of this podcast. And I, for one, am appalled. Just look at yourself in the mirror and know that you have failed not just us, not just yourselves, but your entire species. So, until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com If you want us to read your comments out on the show send us your views, opinions questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base 
End of transmission.